Excel series. In this article, we'll be going through an article on Scythe, the digital magazine from Aeon. And the article is about the recognizing the role of chance in life. Hopefully, uh, when we read through it and we go through it, some tidbits, some input is useful for you. So, let us go. Appreciating the world is a random. Appreciating the world is random and foster perseverance, gratitude for your own luck and empathy for the plight of others. This was the headline. This was like a byline for the article. Your luck, they say, can turn around. All you need to do is work a little harder. As a saying often attributed to the Roman philosopher Seneca goes, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. A similar proverb is dated to 16th century. Diligence is the mother of good luck. And even the French chemist Louis Pasteur, he was the one who came up with pasteurization. And a lot of, I think a lot of vaccines he worked on. But anyway, French chemist Louis Pasteur echoed the idea uh, when he declared in 1854 that chance only favors the mind which is prepared. Today, many of us still believe that our fortunes can be engineered. Basically, we have some modicum of control over our luck, some modicum of control over our fate. But that is not always how the world works. Luck plays an ungovernable and unpredictable role in our lives, which we can't fully mitigate through preparation or diligence. So why do we continue to believe we can turn our luck around? Basically, in the first paragraph, the author has gone into showcasing how it is a very popular idea at different times in history. Roman philosopher, 16th century, somebody said it. Louis Pasteur said it in 1854. That luck can be influenced by hard work. Luck can be influenced by perseverance and diligence. But then the author's personal opinion is. Uh, but that is not how always how the world works. Luck plays an unforgivable, un, sorry, ungovernable. You don't really control it. And random ways it affects our lives in so then he posits a question why do we continue to believe we can turn luck around why do we believe in the idea that we have some degree of control over how luck uh, works out for us on 18th august 1983 at a casino in monte carlo the wur, a roulette wheel was spun and the ball fell on black this is not unusual the alternating red and black colors of a roulette wheel mean that like a coin toss, there is roughly a 50-50 chance that the ball will land on either color. But as the ball continued to land on black again and again and again, gamblers rushed the table, placing bets on red in the belief that the alternating color must be coming up. Convinced that things would eventually balance out, gamblers raised their bets each time the ball landed on black. But they continued to lose. Improbably, the ball would settle on black a total of 26 times. The Monte Carlo policy, also known as the gambler's policy, is the belief that a string of bad luck must end. It is belief that there is a sense of balance in how luck plays out. It explains why gamblers playing roulette mistakenly believe that one color is overdue after a consecutive series of the other color even though the odds remain 50-50. But the relevance of the Monte Carlo fallacy goes far beyond the tendencies of gamblers in casinos. Now, in the first, at the end of the first paragraph, the author had talked of how the how we continue to believe that luck can, luck can somehow be affected by the diligence and the work we put in. We have some degree of control over it. Then, the author has given us an example of Monte Carlo fallacy or the gambler's fallacy wherein we think if we've had bad luck, we expect there is going to be something good that happens to us. He has done that by way of an example of a roulette machine wherein you have roughly 50-50 chance of the ball landing on a black spot or a red spot. So black, 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 when it happened several times over, gamblers rushed over expecting that red, most likely the next outcome will be red. Improbably, it happened for 26 times that we got consecutive reds. 
and the gamblers lost yet they believe for some reason they can have control over luck basically the author is strengthening the idea previously he had mentioned but this is not how luck works it is ungovernable this paragraph is uh, subtly increasing the acceptability of the idea that luck is not governed luck is not governed as in not governable there is no way you can control it luck happens or of its own accord however it wants to happen okay though the anecdotal evidence for the fallacy is well established acha in the at the end of the second paragraph he says this gambler's fallacy goes well beyond gambling so most likely the next paragraph or the next section is going to be about other examples where this gambler's fallacy is in action though anecdotal evidence of the fallacy is well established only in recent decades have experts confirmed our belief that a string of bad luck must end in a 2005 study two researchers studying decision making james sundali and rachel croson analyzed gambling behavior at casinos in reno nevada among those who were making 50 50 bets in roulette sundali and croson found that gamblers who had watched one spin of the wheel evenly divided their bets between red and black however as the wheel landed on red or black in consecutive spins the betting changed significantly after five consecutive reds 65% of the bets were placed on black and after six consecutive reds 85% of the bets were on black though the sixth spin of the roulette wheel is not influenced by the five spins gamblers still place their bets as if it was so if you studied probability in quant this is essentially the fallacy of assuming uh, basically these are independent events what ball what uh, color the ball will land at that is an independent event so what it landed on in the previous trial and what it lands on in this trial these are independent events and that is if you understand the probability aspect of quant then this idea or this paragraph is very simple with passage of time when it happens black 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 let's just like for more regular people because we are in india we do tosses before cricket matches so if i toss a coin and i get a tail and i get another i toss the same coin again i get a tail again if i do toss again i get a tail now in the fourth iteration a lot of people assume that or assume or expect it will be a head because there have been three tails how can it be that we will again get a tail which should be a head but the probability of getting a head or a tail in the fourth toss is still 50 50 nothing has changed these are all independent events that is the idea being mentioned in the third paragraph okay next closely related to this is the mistaken belief that distribution in small numbers will reflect the distribution in large numbers okay this is the sampling error this is the absolute sampling error oh we have gone on to the case of flipping a coin directly wonderful what i mean by sampling error is let's say there are and this you'll understand this you'll understand wonderfully well with your close friends and near and dear ones we have elections right now by the time this will go out most likely the elections will be done but uh, you have over a billion people in this country and a lot of them will also be voting a lot of them are of voting age a lot of them will be voting and then people make estimations of which party will win and which party will not win and which part which person will come to power in their own respective constituency based on a very small sample space that they talk very small sample space and even that small sample space unlike good experiments is not a random collection of people it is people who are pretty much of the same social status people who have pretty much the same goals in life so when we are talking to let's say if you are a college going kid and you talk to college going kids who are, who are voting in election it is highly likely that you would be motivated by same factors and therefore your opinion on issues is going to be very similar or even if it is different even if it is different that cannot be reliably used as an indicator for the overall election because overall election is not comprised only of college going students it also consists of working class population it also consists of business when it also consists of people below the poverty line it also consists of daily laborers all sorts of people are involved 
So if I look at only a sample space of college going students, that is not a very good sample space. And that is where you can perhaps understand the statement. Closely related to this is the mistaken belief that distribution in small numbers will reflect the distribution in large numbers. I know over an extended period of time, if I toss a coin infinite times, half the time I will get heads, half the time I will get tails. That is my expectation. That does not mean when I toss the coin six, uh, 10 times, I will get 5 heads and 5 tails. That does not happen. Okay. I hope that is what the question is saying. Take the case of flipping a coin. The odds in any one flip are 50% heads, 50% tails. If we flip a coin 10,000 times, close to 50% of the total flips will be heads and close to 50% tails. Very expected. However, if we flip a coin 10 times, the result could easily be 7 heads and 3 tails. The result could very well be 10 heads and 0 tails. That is odd. Though it is a mistake to think the odds of a small number of cases will reflect the odds of a large number of cases, we find this belief in many areas of life. For example, parents who have had several children of the same gender may believe that they are overdue for a child of the other sex and that their odds will shift if they keep trying, which happens uh, in especially male dominated societies where if you have let's say three, four, five, six daughters, the parents keep on going until they have a son, which is weird but okay. So first paragraph, I will just summarize this page, in the first paragraph the author is talking of there is a long held belief that you can impact your luck in some way. Three different examples of different times in history when this was spoken of is mentioned. Then the author gives his personal view, no that is not true. Then he posits a question, why do people continue to believe in luck? Then instead of answering that question directly, he is strengthening his argument, luck is not really governable, luck is not really controllable. He starts off by explaining the Monte Carlo fallacy or the gambler's fallacy. Then he explains uh, not only this gambler's fallacy is not an anecdotal evidence alone, this is not something that he is thinking of or he is uh, getting an idea of. There is also experimentation done, two people, Sundali and Cronson found um, gamblers betting in um, let's say leaning fashions, then they saw n number of consecutive reds or blacks coming up on the roulette table, then in the final one. The author is also talking of the error of assuming whatever is the pattern for the small distribution, it will continue for the large distribution. So that is and then uh, an example of people seeking children of the opposite gender, they will keep on trying, assuming if they've had let's say n boys and they want a girl, they expect in the next iteration they will get a girl, which is an independent event. There is no likelihood, the probability of it being a boy or a girl remains fairly identical. Okay, next. Now this is the portion where the author actually starts answering the question positive at the end of paragraph 1. Because the first few words give us that. Part of the reason why we cling to the belief that a string of bad luck must end is that we find it hard to reconcile the difference between odds of large and small numbers. Okay, but there is also a deeper explanation. Basically, in the first line, the author is insulting the general population saying, we are bad at mathematics. Mathematics is not intuitive to us. Mathematics is not intuitive to us and therefore, we are we are unable to reconcile the difference between orders of large and small numbers. Okay, But there is also a deeper explanation for why these policies are so hard to shape. We like to believe that the world is just and fair. We like to believe in balance. Okay. First thing the author said, we are bad at paths. The second thing the author says, we innately believe that the world is fair, there is balance. If there is good, there is evil. If there is light, there is darkness. So if bad events have happened, good events will also happen. That is the expectation we carry. When someone works hard and plays by the rules, we hope they will be appropriately rewarded. When a crime is committed, justice is seen as being served if the criminal is sentenced to a punishment that fits the nature and severity of the crime. On the other hand, if an individual commits a serious crime and is neither apprehended nor punished, we feel an injustice has occurred. This is our understanding of imbalance. 
Thus, in situations where individuals experience events that are incongruent with their prior actions and behaviors, like young children who have terminal cancer or civilians who are killed during a war, the world appears unbalanced and unjust. Our intuitive sense is that such an imbalance must be corrected. Unfortunately, this isn't always possible. This is again the author presenting his own opinion. Unfortunately, this doesn't really happen always. You cannot really restore balance to systems that never even promised balance right at the beginning. Okay. Chance and luck have little interest in our notions of balance and deservedness. In life, bad things can happen to good people and good things can happen to bad people. Which is, I'm sure all of us believe we fall in the first category. Bad things have happened to us, but we are good people. Nobody ever thinks that they fall in the second category. That you are a bad person, you've committed bad, you've committed bad acts, yet uh, by chance you are getting good luck coming your way. You wouldn't really think of it that way, but okay. Understand, nobody is absolutely good, nobody is absolutely bad. It is generally the relationships that you have. In different relationships, whether you, you can be a good person or a bad person, especially in one-off relationships, some even places where you have interacted with the person for a long time, you can be good and bad simultaneously depending upon the context. Anyway, that uh, philosophy aside. Next, chance and luck have little interest in our notions of balance and deservedness. In life, bad things can happen to good people and good things can happen to bad people. Accidents take place, illnesses strike, and unlucky breaks occur indiscriminately. Good people get it, bad people get it. Every so, matlab, there is no rhyme or reason behind it. In this regard, the randomness of the universe is blind to any sense of justice. We can attempt to rectify some of the negative consequences of this randomness and be grateful when good luck strikes, but we should not deceive ourselves into believing that the world is always fair. The author has spoken a line that I absolutely agree with. You should not delude yourself into believing that the world is fair. Even in certain segments, certain portions of your working, you would see bad people getting a lot of power, good people not getting a lot of power, and all sorts of funny things happening. Just because you are doing good, don't expect good things will happen to you. Do good because it is good to do good, not because you expect uh, some sort of return. That is a wonderful idea. Okay. The philosopher Nicholas Rescher stated this, uh, stated this well in Luck 1995 when he wrote. So this book was published in 1995 and this philosopher Nicholas Rescher stated this idea well. The trenchant question of old posed by unfortunate and fortunate alike is, why me? What have I done to deserve this? The irony of course is that the appropriate and correct answer is nothing. It is simply a matter of chance of fortuitous luck. Basically, if something good happens to you or something bad happens to you, why did it happen to you? If you try to look for a reason, there is no reason to it. It is simply you were lucky. It is down to luck. In the best-selling book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, 1981, the US rabbi and author Harold Kushner, I wonder if he is somehow related to Jared Kushner, but okay. The US rabbi and author Harold Kushner attempted to reconcile how God could allow so much injustice in the world. This is one of the most common uh, questions asked, to, asked about existence of God. And the atheist argument is, see, believers believe God is all-powerful, all omniscient, omnipotent, omni, omnipresent, omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent. If all of that is happening, how is it that uh, young children get abducted and assaulted and then good people have bad things happen to them? There are floods in which young children die, there are avalanches, there are earthquakes, there are volcanoes erupting, all sorts of uh, unfair things are happening to undeserving people. So how does that reconcile? 
uh, the argument that propped up from that is see, the concept of rebirth or concept of uh, reincarnation comes from there. So you are getting punished for the bad deeds you did in your last life, or if something bad has happened to you, it will balance out in the next life by something good happening to you. But then it is a very easy theory to hypothesize because there is no way to prove or disprove it. The other idea I'm guessing is coming here. The U.S. rabbi and author Harold Kushner attempted to reconcile how God could allow so much injustice in the world. Kushner explained that these bad things are basically random events. When they occur, one can turn to God for comfort and strength. Yet, as Jane Eisner wrote about Kushner, he believed it is our role to accept the randomness of the universe, not to blame gods, not to blame God or ourselves for tragedies, but to believe in God's omnipotent goodness as a nourishing force. And I find this statement to be extremely, extremely uh, backwards. So I have to accept the randomness of the universe. If the universe is random, how do I know a God exists in the first place at all? And if I will not blame God, if I will not blame God for the bad things that are happening to me, I will of course not be grateful for God as well. I will not turn to God for comfort and strength as well. Because if you cannot save me or if you had no role to play in me having a negative outcome. Why would I attribute the positive outcomes to God? But then I am a very, very staunch atheist. I'm a very, very staunch atheist. But uh, let's see. Not atheist. I'm more of a staunch agnostic. I don't care if God exists. But let's go forward. Consequently, there may be times in life when there is little point to casting about for blame. The randomness of the universe simply does not abide by such a conjurer. In some respects, the understanding can be liberating. Rather than searching for blame for a causal reason, randomness can relieve us from such a burden. Basically what it is highlighting is very often when tragedy strikes, people go start deep diving into why did this happen, why did it happen to me, why did it happen that way, why did it happen this way. If you accept the randomness of the world, if you accept that events happen by chance, you will forget about looking for the why of it and then perhaps you will look at it the next steps. How do we rectify it? How do we fix the problem rather than assign blame? Okay. So how else might we use a deeper understanding of chance and randomness to our advantage? Can luck help create fairness, balance and a better world? I think it can. Okay. Previously, the author has been advocating very much for the fact that there is no balance. There is luck does not get impacted. It is not governable. But now, here it is he's sort of taking a turn. He is sort of going into the opposite end of the spectrum. Can luck help create fairness, balance and a better word? I think it can. Let's see where he is going with this. By recognizing the prevalence of luck, a strong argument can be made for the importance of perseverance in pursuing one goals. This is subtly different to the view of luck presented by Seneca or Pasteur referenced in the first paragraph, in which preparation and work lead to a change of fate. Many decisions affecting us involve some element of randomness and luck and these decisions may have limited little to do with our abilities or credentials. Okay. One of the most random decisions or the most random things that happens in your life is what family you are born in. Understand if you were born in a well of family you would have access to resources, you would have access to sorts of stuff that people with uh, let's say financially disadvantaged backgrounds would not have. But then when it comes to measuring our success against somebody we don't really factor in these things. We only look at the straightforward, directly comparable stuff, my 10th score, your 10th score, my 12th score, your 12th score, which is not really fair, yet when it gives us an advantage, that is the word we go for. Anyway, so what the author is going for, what the author is going for, previously what was being stated, in order to achieve success, you need preparation and luck. And preparation can help you improve luck. This was the idea being stated in the first uh, paragraph. 
or the author is going for, at least right now, this is subtly different to the view of luck presented by Seneca or Pasteur, which is this idea. You need prep and luck in order to be successful and being well prepared, having a lot of perseverance, you can impact your luck. But the author is again making the statement, the randomness of the universe is such that you have very little control over your luck. It doesn't really matter how much you prepare. That will not impact your luck. As US sociologist Michael Sauder has observed, we often blame ourselves for things that could be attributed to chance. We did not get the job we applied for because our application was misplaced by the hiring committee. But we assume we reached too far and attribute the outcome to our lack of worthiness. Okay. Very often we blame ourselves for things that are beyond our control. Uh, okay. In discussing the careers in arts and entertainment fields, where good luck is often a prerequisite for getting ahead, the Canadian author Stephen March has observed that persistence is the siege you lay on fortune. Okay. Stephen March, some Canadian author has stated, persistence is the siege you lay on fortune. <coughs> now siege is a direct attack, a direct invasion, what Israel is doing in Palestine. Persistence is a siege you lay on fortune. You cannot control randomness and chance, but we can increase the odds that chance will shine in our favor by increasing the number of opportunities for a particular result to play out. We can, as the aphorism says, keep many irons in the fire. By being persistent and thus increasing our chances, we also increase the importance of talent and ensure that skill carries more weight. If I can go back to this. For success, you need prep and luck. The previous idea or the prior idea that the author is opposed to is preparation somehow impacts luck. What the author is going for is Yes, for success you need preparation and luck. You do need preparation and luck. But given that luck is ungovernable, that makes preparation all the more important. That makes preparation the only primary thing you can control and you should go all out in order to mm, succeed. What the author is also saying is, if you only make one attempt at success, if you only make one attempt at success, now the impact of luck becomes very huge because if success was dependent on preparation and luck and you are only making one attempt at success if it is bad luck there then you will not obtain success but if you make multiple attempts at success if you have many irons in the fire what is being stated here your likelihood of being successful in one of those trials will increase but then that luck is not the only reason why you would succeed. You would need to have a strong foundation of preparation backing you up. The best example, the best corollary that I can think of. <coughs> when people are planning to go for an MBA, they will appear for CAT, very important exam. But some of them will also appear for NMAT, some of them will also appear for SNAP, some of them will also appear for ZAT. Now you may have a bad luck on in one of these exams, but then if you perform poorly in all the exams, then you can't really blame luck so much because you had four opportunities, you had four opportunities and what was your preparation level? It is not to say that one person cannot be lucky on four different days. There is a possibility, but the likelihood of a person being unlucky on four separate days is lower than the person having a lesser preparation done from their end. So, when you keep many errands in the fire, when you appear for multiple exams, that is great. But at the same time, you have to have to give higher weightage or higher value to your preparation. There is no substitute to hard work. Okay. Recognizing and accepting chance and luck also fosters a heightened sense of gratitude. Recognizing and accepting chance also fosters a heightened sense of gratitude. The recognition of randomness in our lives helps ensure we don't take good things for granted. It helps us understand the precious nature of good fortune. As we gain insights into the world of randomness, we realize how easily we might find ourselves in less favorable conditions. Basically, once you realize that good luck is random, luck is random, when you get a slice of good luck, you also have to acknowledge and understand it could at that very well, at that point could very well be 
slice of bad luck. So you feel a little thankful, you feel a little bit of gratitude that you randomly got good luck. Although even if you don't feel gratitude, you feel luckier compared to other people. That is all that I believe should happen. But okay. The recognition of randomness in our lives helps ensure we don't take good things for granted. It helps understand the precarious nature of good fortune. As we gain insights into the world of randomness, we realize how easily we might find ourselves in less favorable conditions. This is reflected in the saying, count your blessings. Okay. Be thankful for your good luck. But is slightly different in that it recognizes the precariousness of those blessings. In turn, it can help us develop a greater sense of both humility regarding our own accomplishments and empathy for the plight of others. Okay. While there is no denying that hard work and skills are important in life's journey, there is also no denying that luck and chance may be every bit as important in shaping the course of our lives and our achievements. Now understand, while this is true, hard work is important and luck is also important. I think the way the sentence has been framed, it gives a false equivalence idea. Hard work is far more important than luck because hard work is in our control. Luck is not in our control. We don't have luck that we can govern. Luck is not governable as stated. But hard work can be controlled. And if you do the hard work, you put many irons in the fire. One place or the other, that hard work will be rewarded. But uh, if you rely entirely on luck, it wouldn't be as great. So, the framing of the sentence or the argument being made here, hard work is important, but there is no denying that luck and chance may be every bit as important in shaping the course of our lives and our achievement. Don't agree entirely, but that is the author's opinion. will work. This splashes cold water on the belief that we live in a world of strict meritocracy where we deserve all that comes our way. This is absolutely untrue. We do not live in a meritocracy, meritocratic world and not in ways that you think you have been hard done by. In a lot of ways, you have been the recipient of advantage of uh, being born into a good family with good resources. Because I understand most people who appear for CAT, most people who appear for CAT, not all of them, but a lot of them who appear for CAT are uh, people who had decent education. They have done graduation, so you are anyway higher up the education chain than most people in the country. And uh, we are very privileged in the sense that we understand English to a great extent. We have completed a certain degree or are about to complete a certain degree. We think that, oh, whoa, is me, everything is bad happening to me. But there are worse people than us. I'm not saying that you should entirely give up and become a monk and everything. But acknowledge the privilege that we have. Acknowledge the privilege that we have. This is the first step to being more mindful of the journey doesn't stop here. The journey has to keep on going. Okay. This splashes cold water on the belief that we live in a world of strict meritocracy where we deserve all that comes our way. Not really. By recognizing the ubiquitousness, the ever presence, the widespread availability of chance in our lives, we are in a much better position to empathize with the misfortunes of others. Now see, again, I am in a much better position to empathize with the misfortune of others, but very often, and this is my cynical take on stuff, very often people, when they do not get a good outcome, when they do not get a good outcome, try to present it as, oh, it was my bad luck. When the preparation part of it itself was compromised. For instance, and this will rankle people, for a lot of people, a lot of people come up and say, sir, I'm not doing well in RCs or I'm not doing well in parajumbles. And then I follow it up with, have you done, let's say, 300, 400 RCs as practice? No. Have you done 200 RCs as practice? No. Have you done 100 RCs as practice? Yes. Where have you done this practice? In mocks and sections. So you haven't really done any practice. If you haven't done practice and your skill levels are low, then it is not down to luck. It is down to your preparation. Or let's say prior to CAT, people are, I'm not very confident in DILR or I can't solve DILR sets. Have you done like 300, 400 sets as practice? 
No. Have you done 100, 200 sets as practice? Yes. Where have you done it? Only in the mocks and sectionals and the class sheets that we were a part of. Then you haven't done independent outside practice. You haven't really given yourself the chance of developing ways in which you understand equations. Then you can't really blame luck. You can perhaps be thankful for luck. You can perhaps be thankful for luck if it turns out well for you. But you cannot blame luck because <coughs> the preparation part of it was compromised. But okay. You can empathize with people who have put in the work and then had a slice of bad luck and ended up with a bad outcome. But far too often, oh, people blame luck when it was their own efforts that were compromised. Okay. By recognizing the ubiquitousness of chance in our lives, we are in a much better position to empathize with the misfortune of us. Bad luck can strike anyone at any time. Agreed. Accepting this fact allows us to imagine ourselves in a position of less fortunate, of the less fortunate, and creates the possibility for more meaningful and empathetic connections with each other. In this way, recognizing luck has significant policy implications. When we get to policy, we are talking of government, we are talking of administrative bodies. Okay. Randomness underlines the importance of social insurance and so strong social safety net. When we insure our home or car, we don't anticipate having an accident immediately. Instead, we are acknowledging the possibility that we may experience an accident at some point in the future. Likewise, a strong social safety net is designed to protect individuals from bad luck of economic hardship that can strike at any point. Okay, this is basically, uh, it has uh, hints of UBI being thrown, universal basic income idea coming in or unemployment insurance coming in or let's say the idea of the society takes care of its weakest members people who have suffered some sort of bad luck the society will take care of that it will not be as if oh you have you lost your job it must be your fault and you must be punished further for it that is not the attitude we have the attitude we have is okay if something hasn't worked out for you will provide you with aid and support so that you survive and you get another shot at success you try another time of course this doesn't turn into a guaranteed long term plan wherein you never try for anything you always uh, rely on the safety net of others which is why when you have unemployment insurance it pays you for 3 months after which you have to find a job otherwise that unemployment insurance will go away or any sort of bad luck or bad events that happen to you, the support is commensurate with the sort of help you need. It is not like if you were working as a, let's say, uh, bus driver and you lose your job versus you were working as an analyst and you lose your job. The bus driver is more likely to get support than the analyst because the analyst will have more opportunities, will have more opportunities for finding alternate employment. But for the duration both of them are unemployed, the analyst will be compensated more because his standard of living or the way his payments have been structured, his EMIs and his home loans and everything, he would have more obligations to meet. This person would have lesser obligations to meet. Basically, it is usually a function of the basic pay that the people are getting. But that is how social safety nets work. It is not like you will be paid for an infinite period of time for as long as you don't do a job. Okay. Likewise, a strong social safety net is designed to protect individuals from bad luck of economic hardship that can strike at any point. By understanding the frequency and reach of bad luck, we can blunt and contract some of its negative impacts through a set of robust safety net programs. Absolutely wonderful. I am entirely in favor of this idea. The problem is a lot of ideas are good, but when it comes to implementation, because implementation has to be done by human beings. And human beings from the top to the bottom, not all of them may necessarily be ethically and morally aligned to what needs to be done. So there are a lot of leakages in the system which makes it very problematic. Anyway, for the ancient Romans, the goddess of chance, Fortuna, would spin her wheel of fortune, causing some to rise and others to fall. What goes up can come down and vice versa. She delighting in reversing the fortunes of us mortals and 2000 years later she is still spinning her wheel. 
many of us believe that we can find some deeper logic to the outcome of our spinning wheel and anticipate how it will spin. We want to have some degree of control, some degree of influence over how luck plays a role in our life. But things don't always balance out. We can't always turn our luck around. By acknowledging and better understanding chance, we can begin to better coexist as we make our way through life. We can begin to see the world as it is, rather than how we imagined it to be. Our conception that things are fair and balanced and everything will balance out in the long term, not necessarily true. Once you start acknowledging that luck plays an important role, luck plays an important role in how life turns out, then we would be in a better position. Okay, so fun article. I agree mostly with all of it, and uh, I absolutely agree with this idea. Luck is not in our control. Luck is not in our control. So. because luck is not in our control it does not mean it is futile to work hard because luck may trip us up it makes hard work all the more important because that is the only thing you can control and in order to give yourself the best chance of success you must have multiple irons in the fire both these ideas make a lot of sense both these ideas are absolutely fine Again, this is a fairly long article. This is one thousand six hundred and fifty-four words. There were eighty sentences in total. Grade level wise, this is a fairly straightforward article. It's not like a lot of tough words are used. The grade level was eight point two three. Somebody who is in the eighth to ninth grade education level should be able to read this. And the reading is score was seventy three point zero one nine, which means it was fairly easy to read. The article in itself is fairly easy to read. Or uh, the ideas. in fact i think i i don't know but maybe i am simply guessing something i think that uh, articles in eon and psych and everything they are deliberately made long they are deliberately made long for no good reason because you could have entirely done without the monte carlo fallacy example here by simply talking of this paragraph This paragraph adds no value. This paragraph adds no value. Similarly, this fifty percent heads and fifty percent tails idea <coughs> that could have been used to explain the Monte Carlo fallacy. Both these ideas were unnecessary inclusions. Both these ideas were unnecessary inclusions, which don't really add meat to the argument. It simply stretches it out. Similarly. This idea that uh, why me, why me, no luck is random, luck is random. The same idea has been repeated several times over in this article, and by some means and idea, I think this is again this last paragraph. This is like a conclusion which could have been done in one line, but it has been stressed over five lines. Maybe. i am a more minimalist kind of writer and therefore i find the stretching out of ideas to be unsavory but if somebody enjoys reading such things it would be fine okay article difficulty wise fairly straight forward article but long so requires attention carrying of ideas forward hopefully you learned something that will be all for this week okay bye